Uh, when Beverly told me the topic, I said, I could have changed the title of this talk to what else can I tell you about premenopausal puzzle ovaries you don't already know? <laughs> and I thought, okay, well, it's always fun to review what you know, and hopefully you can all come to a consensus that you agree on the same things. So, to begin, the ovary. What a wonderful organ. <laughs> I didn't realize it is the most active organ in the body or one of the most active organs in the body. And those of us who image the ovary appreciate the fact that it has progressed so many changes over the years. And if things go well, you see the diagram on your right, exactly the way the follicles behave when they're predicted to rupture at 14 days. Most of them hopefully do, and some of these, them may take a few days plus or minus, but life goes on. Every month, this whole cycle is repeated. The ovary has a complex embryology and histology, and to look at the number of cells that make up the ovary, you can understand how the potential of each of those cells to form a tumor makes the ovary a, a big organ to monitor for possible uh, tumors, malignancies, or benign tumors. Now, it also is a favorite site for metastasis from other organs, especially the breast, colon, and stomach in about 5 to 30 percent of cases. And those of us who have looked at this diagram about the great synchronicity between the pituitary, the, the ovaries, the endometrium, and the hormones that go up and down as scheduled, realize that things don't always go exactly the way you want them to go. And so we are there to look for the reasons why these things do not happen. And this is part of the excitement of imaging the ovary. Now, ultrasound, of course, is recognized as the modality to monitor all the changes in the ovary, especially transvaginal sonography. It has allowed us to not only directly evaluate the many ovarian functions uh, more than any other modern technique, it also allows us to morphologically evaluate the ovary as an organ. Uh, it has allowed us to offer more assisted conception therapy services. And for the first time, we can better understand the physiology and pathophysiology of ovarian blood flow because of transvaginal color Doppler. So I hope in the next 20 minutes or so I could go over this outline of presentation that I thought would be a good review for, for all of us in this room. And I will skip through the ovarian masses pretty quickly because I know you've seen all of them already. So when I lecture to my residents, I always show them this beautiful diagram from Dr. Netter's Siba Geige collection. But I always preface it with, do not expect to find the ovaries in exactly the location that this drawing tells you, because that's not reality. Like, sure, you can find the left ovary maybe a little more in an, a higher position than the right, but always remember to look for the right ovary in the cul-de-sac because they have the, prop the propensity to hide in there when you could not find them in the adnexal area that you've been scanning. But I thought this diagram uh, settles you on what the relationship of the organs ideally should be in the pelvis if things are ideal as this. But you sometimes forget that the ovaries, the ovaries are usually posterior to an antiverted, antiflexed uterus, and the ovarian ligament attaches the ovary to the uterus. The fallopian tubes are supposed to be right next door. You don't see the fallopian tubes until it, it fills up with some uh, fluid or blood. But look at the relationship of the ovary to the ureter and the vessels that go along with it. This is a, a good diagram to remind us that pelvic pain is not always the problem of the ovary or the uterus. There are other things in the pelvis adjacent to the ovary and the uterus that can produce that symptom. Now, nature made sure that the ovary will always be supplied. So it gave it two blood supplies. One is from the ovarian arteries that directly come off the aorta, crosses the pelvic brim at the level of the common iliac artery, and then enters the suspensory ligament to get into the ovary. The second one is the ovarian branch of the uterine artery that anastomose with the ovarian artery from the aorta to provide the artery, uh, the ovary, with the blood supply it needs to carry on its function. 
Now, I'm not going to go through these ovarian volumes, but as you can see in a premenopausal um, woman, the ovary can go up to about 22 cc's maximum and still be normal. But on the average, I think it's about 11 to 12 cc's using the formula of the ellipse to compute ovarian volumes. Now, technically, the ovary is really part of the adnexa. But we don't just lump it with the adnexa. We always say the ovary and the adnexa because we want to underline how important its function is compared to all the other things that belong to the adnexa. When we look for the ovaries, especially in patients who are a little challenging to image, we always use the external iliac vein or the internal iliac artery as our landmarks to say that this is where the ovaries should be because they, they form the borders of the ovary when we try to find them. So yeah, we are one of the few people who image our ovaries this way, but we also read from many centers that do it the other way, but at least I know my residents can look at publications from the UK or other European era nations that display their images this way. So premenopausal ovary, you go for the volume of the ellipse formula to get the, uh, the uh, volume, and so you always measure the longitudinal and the AP diameter on a sagittal view, and only use the transverse view or the coronal view for the transverse measurement. And here's one of our um, iliac vessels for guidance. Now, I used to think when I was in medical school that follicles don't begin until after menses has occurred. But we all now know that recruitment of follicles begin before the start of menses. We start seeing follicles about day five to seven, and the dominant follicles begins to show itself around day eight to 12. And the non-dominant follicles usually stay no larger than about 14 millimeters in size. Now, sometimes you could have bleeding into the follicle at ovulation, called the uh, corpus hemorrhagicum but the corpus luteum can grow up to two to three centimeters over the next four to five days after ovulation. Now, my reproductive endocrinologist colleague told me that we only see corpus luteum cysts when the corpus luteum hemorrhages. He says otherwise, you can just see the corpus luteum as a vacant spot in the ovary without necessarily forming a cyst. So here's an adolescent ovary. I promise not to talk about the uterus or the postmenopausal ovaries. And the only reason why we know they are ovaries is because there are follicles that we see, no matter how tiny they are, and that they're adjacent to the pelvic sidewall that is um, uh, denoted by the artifact that you see from the bone. Now in the early follicular phase, you can see the, the, the follicles start showing up, but they're pretty much uniform in size. In the late follicular or periovulatory phase, as uh, reflected by the endometrium, you start seeing the dominant follicle. And on the other side, the follicles do not declare one dominant or the other, but because the other side is already determined to be the dominant ovary for the month. And the reproductive endocrinologists monitor these follicles very, very um, uh, frequently because they don't want to harvest eggs beyond the follicle size of two centimeters. They said ideally they'd like to be at 1.5, between 1.5 and two. So those of uh, you who may work with in reproductive endocrinologists know that they're at, your, you're in, at their beck and call whenever they need to find the ideal time to harvest the follicle. As you can see, on the non-active ovary of the month, there is no dominant follicle. Now, as you proceed to the luteal or secretory phase, you can see follicles that did not um, make it into being dominant. But on the other side, even if you don't see a corpus luteum cyst, you know that the ovulation has already occurred, as declared by this vacant spot in the midst of the normal-looking follicles. Now, we don't do routine Doppler evaluation of the ovaries, but I do have a couple of colleagues who will call a patient back if the sonographer did not get the picture of the color Doppler of the ovaries. They just feel more comfortable if uh, there's a picture that shows color within the ovaries saying that there's flow. But what it teaches us is not only can you tell 
where, which one is the ovary of the month, because it always has a high velocity, low resistance flow, compared to the quiescent uh, ovary that has a high resistance flow. And resistive indices of ovarian flow are the lowest just before ovulation, hours before the ovulation. And when corpus luteum is maintained, then you, it, the RI remains slow until the cycle starts all over again. You can also tell by using power Doppler which of the follicles are probably uh, the ones that are gonna ovulate because they receive the most flow. Now in 2009, we all know that that's when the uh, landmark consensus conference on the management of uh, asymptomatic ovarian cysts happened. This was the program of the day that the uh, experts from different specialties came together. Um, I think it's over in the um, um, Sofitel Hotel now, over there in the, across the, uh, the, the, the street. And on the second day, they came to a consensus that was published a year later in radiology. And we know that we keep this article in our reading room areas for reference for newbies or to show clinicians that this is where we come up with the idea of no uh, recommendation for follow-up or suggest further evaluation depending on the criteria outlined in this article. And this is a must-read article for my residents. It also is interesting to find out that the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists in cooperation with the British Society of Gyne Gynecological Endoscopy came up with their own guidelines about a year after we came up with ours. And according to the background and introduction provided in that document, they claim that about up to 10% of women will have some form of surgery during their lifetime because of an ovarian mass. The premenopausal woman almost has ovarian masses in cysts that are predominantly benign, but the chances of a symptomatic ovarian cyst being malignant in a premenopausal woman is pegged at one in 1,000, increasing to about three to one in 1,000 at the age of 50 years. And it also agrees that differentiation between benign and malignant ovarian masses could be problematic, except for some germ cell tumors that have markers like um, HCG and alpha fetoprotein that will more or less cue you on the nature of that ovarian mass. But there are a lot of uh, masses, about 10% of them, that end up being non-ovarian in origin, and you can see the list of masses that they um, put in the first table of this guideline. So they also recommended that ultrasound is the primary imaging for assessing ovarian masses, and at the present time, do not recommend CT or MRI because they do not improve sensitivity or specificity that we get by transvaginal sonography. And to me, what is most interesting is, a year after we came out with our guidelines for the management of asymptomatic ovarian cysts, the British um, organization embraced our recommendations. So the SRU has done a great thing, and it's just not for US consumption. It is now also held by our colleagues across the channel. So we all know what a simple cyst look like. We know it's an ovarian cyst because the follicles are squashed by this uh, beautiful uh, nanechoic simple cyst. And obviously, trying to image the same cyst in a trans-abdominal approach is not going to give you the resolution and the beautiful uh, definition of the walls of that simple cyst. And whenever we see a uh, benign-looking simple cyst, we always assume that they're either follicular corpus luteum, and maybe some paraovarian cysts, but these should all be reported as benign. In reproductive age women, um, corpus luteum cysts are common, especially when you see this uh, rich blood supply that goes around it. Sometimes they could even be uh, more than this and be called a ring of fire because corpus luteum cysts have been reported to have more of this ring of fire phenomenon more than an ectopic pregnancy. So we use the same criteria that we use for any cyst, but 
because it's associated with a pregnancy, we always assume it's a corpus luteum cyst, and if it's complicated, you may recommend a follow-up as needed, but most of the time, if you think it's a corpus luteum, you do not have to recommend a follow-up. Now, in the time of the oral boards for radiology, I still remember whenever we would go to Louisville to give oral boards, there is always a case of hemorrhagic cyst in the pile. Every half day, there's always a hemorrhagic cyst, but they're all given in different stages of development. And all we wanted to hear is the examinee mentioning hemorrhagic ovarian cysts, at least in their differential, being cognizant of the fact that they could change depending on the timing of the imaging uh, versus the, the state of the clot retraction. So we are familiar with the so-called fish netting appearance, the retracting clot, no internal flow, and because they are not simple, we could recommend a remote follow-up for a, um, a cyst that is more than five centimeters because of the remote chance of malignancy, but when you have these very typical findings, especially when you follow them up later, they either decrease in size or convert from a low resistance Doppler pattern to a high resistance Doppler pattern, then you rest assured that you were dealing with a physiologic cyst that just happened to be hemorrhagic. Other benign cysts that we have encountered, endometriomas, they always look like that. Um, no matter what you do, they always don't change. They look like that every time. Um, sometimes, they might even show you this layered appearance because old blood and new blood can, you know, come together. The chocolate cyst nomenclature refers to the fact that you always find thick blood um, clots and new blood combined when you open this cyst. There could be layering debris. They usually have thick walls. And again, no Doppler flow in the walls. Now, sometimes they may come to you in the middle of the night, be requested to do an ultrasound on a very tender, abdominal lump that turns out to be an endometrial implant. And these are very, very tender. And uh, sometimes if you have not seen one before, you might worry that this could be some kind of sarcoma or something, but it is known to appear as a lump that is very tender in the superficial abdomen. We know what dermoids look like, but again, to underline the fact that endovaginal is the way to go, this is the same cyst. You just don't see any of this detail in a transabdominal scan. So even if you see the problem transabdominally and you can measure it and you know where it is, it's always best to do a transvaginal to see the typical dermoid plug and the, you know, the uh, sebum that you see there, the hair floating in the sebum, the shadowing uh, dense material like cartilage, bone, whatever, teeth. And to me, a dermoid is always a good differential for any mass that you see in the pelvis. And that's what I tell my residents all the time. When I give a lecture on dermoids, I always show this. This is my first dermoid. I was so proud of having made this, you know, pickup early in my career. And just because we saw an incidental uh, series of molars in the left side of the pelvis, and we decided to suggest an ultrasound and found this dermoid that has the typical strands of hair floating in it. But this is definitely dated uh, because this was one of our very first ultrasound machines. What about solid ovarian tumors? It is said that predominantly solid ovarian neoplasms are a minority in the premenopausal woman, and they are predominantly benign. And you can see the list of what they are. 28% are epithelial in origin. 22% are germ cell tumor in origin. This is where the disgerminomas and the teratomas come in. And you have 21% sex cord um, stromal tumor origin and the metastatic tumors, the Krukenberg tumors, account for about 20% of all the predominantly solid ovarian tumors. Now we know what cancer looks like, and it is interesting that it is the most common cause of cancer death from gynecologic tumors in the United States, but it's barely mentioned in the incidence table that I'll show you in a minute. They include primary lesions arising from normal structures in the ovary, and again, epithelial ovarian cancer is the majority of ovarian malignancies, and the germ cell and sex cord and the metastatic tumors are in the minority. Now, if you look at the American Cancer Society graph, you can see that the ovary is not even on this list as far as estimated new cases go. 
But look at where it is in the estimated deaths. It's second to breast among the gynecologic cancers as the estimated cause of death. So that is why we still have a problem in putting out a reliable ovarian cancer screening program. And I know that we're still working in the era of genomics, so hopefully one of these days we will have a more efficient way of monitoring ovaries rather than answering phone calls asking for screening ultrasounds because somebody had a grandmother that died of ovarian cancer. We know what the malignant cystic ovarian tumors look like. Not only are they uh, full of debris, they have very irregular thick nodules. Um, confirm on CT, they could have flow, and this is probably one of the best um, evidence that you have that you're dealing with a uh, aggressively growing tumors when you see blood flow in this thick septi. Sometimes when you have other diseases that invade the ovary, you could have a hypoechoic mass with very irregular borders mixed in with the follicles in the normal ovarian tissue. This one happens to be a lymphoma affecting the ovary. And the high velocity, low resistance blood flow that we see both in malignant tumors and in rip roaring acute PID is always indicative of a rapidly metabolizing mass. So what about polycystic ovarian disease? My residents always ask me whether this is a diagnosis we should make, knowing that there's a series of laboratory and clinical scenarios that would make the diagnosis rather than us suggesting it. But we see this configuration all the time to where if there is no clinical indication for PCOS and the medical record doesn't say anything about PCOS, we always say something like the appearance of the ovaries are consistent with PCOS given the right clinical setting. So hopefully it calls the attention of the clinicians to look into that possibility even if there are no classic symptoms that go with it. One thing that I read lately, which I thought was eye-opening, because I always thought that polycystic ovarian syndrome was an ovarian issue. Nowadays, it is thought to be a result of endocrine disorders characterized by a series of hormone imbalances. So it's not really the ovaries' fault. It's just called polycystic ovarian disease because of that manifestation. So hyperandrogenism and insulin resistance combine to produce the results of what we see in PCOS clinically. The um, hyperandrogenism um, is uh, from the excess testosterone that's produced in this disease. They can prevent ovulation, thus the amenorrhea. And the insulin resistance component causes excess of insulin and glucose in the blood and in turn continue to pump out excess estrogen, destabilizing the whole hormonal system. On top of that, the excess insulin causes the ovaries to produce excess testosterone and just confounding the whole problem. And it increases the conversion of testosterone to estrogen, which affects weight gain and the formation of ovarian cysts. So from a systemic point of view, PCOS is likely due to a continuing hormonal imbalance rather than the fault of the ovary. So they always look like this. And when you see a big, thick stroma with more than 10 follicles that are uniform in size that rim the whole ovary, and you start suggesting that it may be PCOS because it always looks like that. Many different patients always show you this beautiful pattern of a thick ovarian stroma and a lot of tiny follicles rimming the rim. What about torsion? There's a lot of literature in torsion that um, educates us about when we should call it. So torsion usually does not give you a normal looking ovary picture. That's why to me, if the ovary looks perfectly normal, chances are you're not dealing with an acute torsion at the time that the ER sends you the patient. But it constitutes 35% of GYN emergencies, happens more in premenopausal women, and if there is a mass that serves as the focal point, that's where the torsion tend to happen. That's why they say torsion of a normal adnexa is rare. We are familiar with the signs of patients that present with ovarian torsion. And from this article, you can see this beautiful edematous ovary with free fluid. Um, usually, these ovaries are so big and they're located in an unusual location for an ovary. 
And you should be looking for coiled or twisted vessels. Now, personally, I've never seen this, but this article in 2004 claimed that all 21 patients showed the whirlpool sign. And if you happen to cut them on a sagittal view, you can see the, the row of the twisted pedicle here and the vessels that go around the whirlpool sign. And this is correlated by a laparoscopic appearance of the torsed ovary in comparison to the normal ovary on the other side. Now, Doppler intortion, I'm sure you must have, you know, called, been, been called several times by sonographers and residents to say, well, there is flow in the ovary, so there couldn't be torsion. We are told that the presence of the central venous flow is predictive of variant viability, but just because you see arterial flow does not mean that torsion is absent. You got a bad looking ovary and all you see is arterial flow, you have to keep looking for the central venous flow that would help you say that the ovary is probably viable. However, in partial torsion or um, repeated torsion and untorsion, this criteria could be a problematic thing. So this is my um, official ovarian torsion slide because there was a, a nexal cyst right next to the torsed ovary. We did see some venous flow in the periphery, but this is the one place that we found it. It was never found within the big ovary. It was an occasional arterial flow, but most of the uh, torsed ovary looked more like uh, no flow at all, and it was proven to be torsion at surgery. So torsion assess ovarian location. Um, if there's a cyst or mass, be suspicious. Look for the pedicle sign. And if the ovary looks perfectly normal, it's probably not torsed. How about ovarian hypostimulation syndrome? I have seen a few of this, and to me they're fascinating because if they come in with a history of, yeah, I've had some fertility um, procedures done, then you can say, yeah, that's OHSS. And uh, the ovary undergoes extensive luteinization, releasing large amounts of estrogen, progesterone, and that's what produces the shift of the intravascular compartment to the pleural and abdominal cavities. But sometimes you see this in normal pregnancies. I've seen several of these, and these are not palpable clinically, even at the size that they are. So what do you do? You wait. Because even if they're 17, 20 centimeters bilaterally, patient is asymptomatic, of course you advise her just in case it becomes torsed or hemorrhagic, and you have to come to the ER for that. But if you just wait, they will regress. Two months postpartum, they could look almost normal. And so this goes to the category of touch-me-not cysts. And finally, as rare as an ovarian ectopic is, they do occur. I've never seen one. So I had to borrow one from the uh, internet. We thought at first this was an ovarian ectopic, but you can see that the ovary is clearly not part of this whole uh, gestational sac. To have an ovarian ectopic, you should have one that is surrounded by ovarian tissue. And so from the internet, you get these pictures that have follicles that tell you that, yeah, that's, that's definitely within the ovary. That's the only way that you could make the diagnosis of an ovarian ectopic. But most of the time, these are probably corpus luteum cysts or hemorrhagic cysts in the ovary. So in summary, to get good and adequate evaluation of the premenopausal ovary, we all have to be um, conscious of how dynamic these changes in the ovary are and always know more or less where we are in that cycle related to the patient's last menstrual period, which should be the number one question you should ask your patient that comes in for a pelvic ultrasound. And to me, having the SRU consensus guidelines in your reading room pasted on the wall as reference before you follow up um, an ovarian cyst finding or re recommend further evaluation is, has been very helpful. So if you don't have that in your reading room yet, just print the article, stick it on a, a um, uh, transparent cover, and hang it with Velcro st strips on the wall of your reading area because you are going to need it. So with that, I end this lecture, and thank you very much.